Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, An Introduction to Invasive Species with Remote Sensing Tools. My name is Sativa Cruz, and I'm a trainer with NASA's Applied Remote Sensing Training Program, also known as RCET. Today, I'm going to explain we are part of the Ecological Conservation Team and based out of NASA Ames Research Center. Our full team is pictured here. I'd like to just take a moment to acknowledge them. There are also many people behind the scenes who are making this webinar possible. Thank you all. So a bit about RCEP. The RCEP program was developed to provide accessible, relevant, and cost-free training on remote sensing, satellites, sensors, methods, and tools. Our trainings cover many topics in areas such as agriculture, climate and resilience, disasters, ecological conservation, health and air quality, and water resources. They are tailored for audiences with a wide range of experience levels. We offer both online and in-person trainings that are either hosted live or self-paced. As I mentioned before, our trainings are free and we often offer bilingual options. To increase access, we use open software and data as well as accommodate differing levels of expertise, visit the RCEP to learn more. Since this is an introductory series, there aren't many prerequisites. However, we do recommend you watch the webinar, Fundamentals of Remote Sensing, prior to taking this training. Today's session will provide an introductory overview of invasive species monitoring using remote sensing. Invasive species are non-native organisms whose introduction causes or is likely to cause harm to the environment, human health, or the economy. With a changing climate, we are experiencing the movement of some invasive species occurring more rapidly and at scales larger than we have observed in the past. Invasive species have impact all over the world. They are direct drivers of change, causing biodiversity loss and negative impacts on the economy, food security, water security, and human health. The Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Service, or IPBES for short, released the report on the thematic assessment of invasive alien species and their control in 2023. It states that invasive alien species are a significant factor that directly or indirectly caused 60% of documented global animal and plant extinctions. And it's estimated that there is an economic impact of $423 billion. Invasive species can be a variety of species, such as plants, animals, and fungi, which is illustrated here with some examples on this diagram. However, in this training, we will directly be highlighting the applications of remote sensing for invasive plants. We hope by the end of this three-part series that participants will be able to recognize the extent and impacts of invasive species on biodiversity and a changing climate, identify the types of remote sensing data and products that can be used for invasive species mapping and monitoring, explore key considerations, benefits, and limitations of remote sensing data sets for invasive species, identify where to access remote sensing data for monitoring invasive species, and mapping relevant habitat and climate variables, as well as evaluate remote sensing methods used to monitor aquatic and grassland invasive plant species. This is part one in a series of three webinars that will take place over the next few weeks. Today's introductory session will be followed by two guest lectures. Part two next week will occur at the same time and will cover the monitoring of aquatic species with remote sensing with Aaron Hester from UC Merced. The following week will conclude with the monitoring of species with hyperspectral remote sensing presented by Hamed Golizade from Oklahoma State University. To receive a certificate of completion, participate
must complete the homework, which opens on August 28th and closes on September 11th. Everything will be posted on the training webpage. As we go through the series, if you have any questions, please put them in the questions box and we will address them at the end of the webinar. Feel free to enter your questions as we go. We'll try to get all of the questions answered during the Q&A session after the webinar. The remainder of questions that are not answered during the Q&A session will be answered in the Q&A document, which will be posted to the training website about a week after the training. Let's jump in. In this aim to address the following objectives, recognize the extent and impacts of invasive species on biodiversity and a changing climate, identify commonly used types of remote sensing data and data products that can be used for invasive species mapping and monitoring, identify upcoming satellite missions with applications for invasive species research, Identify where to access commonly used remote sensing data for monitoring invasive species and mapping relevant habitat and climate variables. Identify key considerations, benefits, and limitations of remote sensing data sets for invasive species. Differentiate the properties of multispectral and hyperspectral data sets for monitoring invasive species. And cite remote sensing methods used in invasive species monitoring from past NASA projects and recent literature. The IPBES report referenced earlier shared that is, it is estimated that more than 37,000 established invasive species have been recorded worldwide. This number includes more than 3,500 invasive species with known negative impacts. This diagram presented in the report shows the abundance of both terrestrial and marine invasives. Note the large amount of terrestrial invasives in Australia and the United States, as well as marine invasives along the Pacific coast. It's important to note that the definition of invasive species is context specific and that all invasive species are native to somewhere. When removed from their ecosystem, they may become invasive. They may outcompete native species exert new pressures, or disrupt ecosystem services. Climate change, along with the continued intensification and expansion of land use change, has resulted in the increase of invasive species at unprecedented rates. Human activities and climate change may lead to future increases in the establishment and spread of invasive species in disturbed habitats and in nearby natural habitats. As the IPBES report notes, climate change interacting with land and sea use change is predicted to profoundly shape and amplify the future threat from invasive alien species. This webinar attempts to highlight remote sensing as a tool that can help us monitor invasives, as well as help develop models which can predict where invasives are likely to spread. Remote sensing of invasives has increased in popularity, evident by the increase in the number of publications, including the terms both remote sensing and invasive species. So what is remote sensing? Remote sensing is the science of collecting information about an object from a distance. This could be done in a variety of ways, including ground-based, airborne, and space-based methods. Remote sensing is helpful in that it allows for large area monitoring with measurements that are consistent, objective, and repeatable. It also allows us to compare with ground measurements, offers a time series capability, and helps us learn about remote locations that are difficult to access. Different sensors are used depending on their application. So how does it work? The energy Earth receives from the sun is called electromagnetic radiation. This energy or radiation is reflected, absorbed, or emitted by the Earth's surface or atmosphere. Satellites carry sensors which can electromagnetic radiation that is either reflected or emitted from terrestrial and atmospheric sources.
The electromagnetic spectrum consists of the range of radiation organized by its wavelength. Radio waves make up the longest wavelengths with the lowest frequencies, while gamma waves are at the far end characterized by short wavelengths and high frequencies. The human eye can detect the visible light range as highlighted here with the rainbow. Sensors can gather information about the world around us in more detail across the spectrum. Every material and surface reflects and absorbs energy in different waves. Satellite-based sensors primarily record the reflected energy. Understanding the unique spectral signatures of different surfaces allow us to tell them apart. This graphic displays the percent reflection at different wavelengths for soil, vegetation, and water. The percent reflection is the amount of reflected energy that occurs for different materials along the electromagnetic spectrum. This graph highlights the wavelengths in the visible, near infrared, and intermediate infrared portions. Satellite sensors can collect regions on the electromagnetic spectrum at various lengths and divide that range into bands. Bands are essentially how big of a portion of the spectrum is included in the measurement. Spectral resolution signifies the number and width of spectral bands of the sensor. The higher the spectral resolution, the narrower the wavelength range for a given channel or band. More and finer spectral channels enable remote sensing of different parts of the Earth's surface. Spectral resolution depends on satellite orbit configuration and sensor design. Different sensors have different resolutions. Bands typically expand beyond the visible range into the infrared spectrum and sometimes into the ultraviolet spectrum. Notice here the difference of bands between multispectral and hyperspectral sensors. Hyperspectral having a higher resolution with more narrower bands present. Satellite imagery also varies in spatial resolution, which signifies the ground surface area that forms one pixel in the image. The pixel size of the image, that is the smallest possible feature that can be detected, which is usually measured in meters, the higher the spatial resolution, the less area is covered by a single pixel. Satellites also take varying times to complete an orbit, and this is called the revisit time or temporal resolution. This is dependent on satellite and sensor capabilities, swath overlap, and latitude. You can see the differences listed here between three popular satellites in terms of temporal and spatial resolution. So how can we use remote sensing for invasive species detection? There are two primary ways that are used to determine invasive plant species. One is to focus on the spectral differences of species. This diagram highlights spectral differences for a variety of plant species. And the source is listed here. Classification. Spectral differences allow us to differentiate between surfaces through a process called classification. With enough information, it's sometimes possible to tell the difference between species of plants. Another methodology is to use the natural annual cycle of recurrent events, such as the seasonal cycle of a tree known as phenology. Phenological events change from year to year. The timing of these events, such as the flowering, leafing, migration, and insect emergence can impact how plants and animals are able to thrive in their environment. It also influences abundance and distribution of organisms, ecosystem services, and global cycles of water and carbon. Phenological events are sensitive to climate change, and not all species change at the same rate or direction. This figure shows model trends in lilac and honeysuckle first bloom dates at weather stations across the 48 states. This map compares the average first bloom date during two 10-year periods. One driver of phenology is temperature, which is shown here for the U.S. as a trend in increasing temperature. 
Another driver is water availability, which is changing across the globe. This is made visible here using NASA's Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment, or GRACED, data. This diagram was presented on the article linked on the slide, where researchers found that the world's high latitude regions, including the northern half of the United States, as well as the global tropics, the low latitudes, are getting wetter. While at the same time, the mid latitudes, or the arid to semi arid belt found in between, are getting drier. We've covered briefly drivers of phenology as well as its application in invasive species monitoring, but it also has a variety of applications beyond assisting in invasive species management, such as predictions of human health related events like allergies or mosquito borne illnesses, crop management understanding of carbon cycling and climate change vulnerability. The use of satellites and sensors allows us to track seasonal patterns of variation in vegetated land surfaces. This is also called land surface phenology. We can regularly monitor the entire globe and land surface, gather information on entire ecosystems, allowing the observation of broad scale trends. However, it is most useful when it's linked with ground observation. Additional uses include crop health assessments, drought severity, wildfire risks, mapping infectious disease risks, and as we've been highlighting, invasive species and pest tracking. Linked here is the full training on understanding phenology with remote sensing, and we encourage you to explore further. And with that, I will hand over the mic to Justin to share some examples of remote sensing of invasives. Thank you, Sativa. And now let's go on to looking at some examples. In some cases, it is impractical to directly map invasive species. In these cases, it may be possible to use information we know about the growing conditions which are favorable to the invasive species to map areas at risk for the establishment of invasives. Here, two species were identified, and their potential range map was derived from terrain and climate data across a large area of the Alaskan wetlands. This information allows resource managers to prioritize their efforts on the highest risk areas. Some invasive species require a more easily mappable host species as part of their life cycle. Hemlock forests in the U.S. are under threat from a small invasive insect. Using multispectral remote sensing and crowdsourced in situ observations, this team created maps of likely compromised hemlock stands, as well as a risk assessment for currently unaffected hemlock stands. Invasive species are bound to habitats that offer favorable conditions for food and reproduction. As the climate continues to change, the distribution of those favorable conditions changes as well. Rather than only responding to invasive species after they've already become established, it's preferable to use models of future conditions to stop invasives before they can spread. This can mean many things, from denying invasives the conditions they need to become established, to increased monitoring of vulnerable areas, or public information campaigns to reduce the chance that invasive species breaks containment. Now, I want to go over some recent literature which makes use of remote sensing and pick out a few generalizable lessons learned. This paper describes the identification of invasive lupines, a group of plants in the pea family, using both supervised and unsupervised classification methods and data collected from a hyperspectral sensor aboard a UAV. One highlight is that they discovered that the timing of their imagery collection was an important factor in getting good data for use in classification. Knowing the phenology of the invasives and background species allowed them to pick imagery collection windows that maximize the model's ability to differentiate between invasive and non-invasive plants. Sometimes, more data is just undeniably better. This group set out to explore methods for improving their detection capabilities in cases where the data is less than ideal. They found that they could use multiple sensors to improve the overall classification accuracy. Even though the sensor data were individually noisy, they performed better when taken together. This is especially exciting as it indicates that for some problems, the answer isn't always finding ways to get better data, which can be expensive and time consuming, 
but rather to increase the number of data sources. This review effort looked at more than two decades of research into invasive species using remote sensing in Sub-Saharan Africa. They found that functional trait-based techniques improved the detection of invasive species, as well as improving the prediction of where invasives may become established in the future. This underscores the importance of understanding how a target invasive species behaves in its non-native environment in order to accurately assess, predict, and remediate the damage done by invasive species. It would be impossible to list all of the possible considerations and complications that can come up in the course of a remote sensing-based study, but there are a few which are common enough to warrant mentioning. Rather than a comprehensive list, let's discuss just a few of the common issues that warrant consideration before beginning a study. Many satellite-based sensors have spatial resolutions that equate to tens of square meters on the ground. If your target species of interest is not established in unified stands representing a significant portion of an image pixel, it may be hard or impossible to pick up its signal against the background. Airborne sensors generally offer a significantly higher spatial resolution but may be prohibitive in terms of the time and cost associated with things such as hiring a pilot and securing the necessary permits. Satellites have fixed orbital characteristics, which limits how often they're able to image the same part of the Earth. This is fine for slow-moving processes, but is sometimes insufficient for things that change very quickly or those that tend to have their imagery compromised by seasonal storms or cloud cover. Carefully consider the temporal realities of your environment to determine the maximum time between images that would still offer meaningful results. Consider the phenology of your target species as well as other species in the environment to ensure that the product you choose can capture the phenomena that you're interested in. Even when direct observation is possible, you must consider how you plan to differentiate your species of interest from the background. Is there a way to exploit differences over time or some effect on the landscape that you can more easily observe? For example, invasive beavers in Patagonia are perhaps more easily observed by their effects on water. Seasonal cloud cover, the maturity of data, and the revisit period set limits on the usefulness of remotely sensed products. Selecting a product that has good coverage of your time and place is critical to a successful analysis. Corrections and harmonized data products are useful in providing longer archives. While freely available data sets are usually sufficient for research, you may determine that it's necessary to buy commercially available data or, at the extreme end, consider flying a mission that meets your specifications. Price will be an important factor in deciding what data you can collect. Deciding early which sensors and platforms are appropriate allows for smart budgeting and avoids issues such as scheduling collections and clearing permits. Supplementing free data with in situ observations for other ancillary data may be a cost-effective solution to more expensive options. All data will require some level of analysis. Consider what methods and models are appropriate for your use case. Ensure that you have the resources to conduct the analysis and interpret the results. Simplify the analysis framework to avoid unnecessary complexity, encourage ease of interpretation, and promote easy replication. Now let's take a look at some satellites and sensors. The Moderate Resolution Imaging Spectroradiometer, MODIS, is a popular multispectral instrument with an archive beginning in 2000. It has a moderate spatial resolution of 250 meters. MODIS images the entire Earth every one to two days, with the same ground track being repeated every 16 days. VIRS is commonly compared to MODIS and shares many similarities. The revisit time of 16 days and whole globe imaging time of one day closely matches that of MODIS. Data is available from 2012 to present and includes analysis products such as vegetation indices and thermal anomalies. Combined with MODIS, VIRS forms the backbone of the firm's fire information database. Built and operated by NOAA, AVHRR is aboard a constellation of satellites which give the sensor a high temporal resolution with overpasses twice per day. 
AVHRR offers a relatively long archive, but with a limited number of bands. CWIFS was an instrument specifically designed for aquatic applications. Though it's no longer operational, CWIFS provided an important high temporal resolution perspective on ocean color and terrestrial plant ecology, which is particularly useful when combined with ancillary data to determine the response of photosynthetic organisms to environmental drivers. EcoStress is a targeted sensor aboard the ISS with the primary purpose of measuring evapotranspiration, the process by which water is exchanged between land and atmosphere via plants, for 12 key climate zones and fluxnet sites. The low Earth orbit of the ISS limits the spatial resolution, but provides good temporal resolution for the areas of interest. SVG is an upcoming mission which aims to meet needs identified in the 2018 Decadal Survey. Though little has been settled regarding the exact specifications, hyperspectral and thermal data are under consideration. Possible applications may include human impacts, water cycle, biodiversity, carbon cycling, and others. PACE is a new mission specifically focused on imaging ocean color with a hyperspectral instrument at very fine spectral resolution. Though it has a short period of record, PACE represents the latest advancement in our ability to image atmospheric and oceanic water, as well as our ability to monitor different kinds of plankton and algae. HIMAP is a commercially available hyperspectral instrument with high spatial and spectral resolution. The imaging swaths are limited in range by its aircraft mounting, but it provides exceptional performance over the areas where missions are flown. It has found applications in the private sector for mineral detection, as well as many other applications in the public sector. IMAP is a great example of how purpose-built instruments and tasking can improve the performance of remote sensing techniques. Glimmer is a mission that specifically focuses on the confluence of large drainage basins into the gulfs and oceans. It is slated to launch in the next few years, so there is no data yet available for analysis. However, the focus area of the Glimmer mission promises a huge upgrade in our understanding of biogeochemistry in coastal and major river deltas in the Americas. JEDI is a suite of LIDAR products which are designed to peer deeper into the vegetated landscapes of the world. Using the response times from its active LIDAR emitter, JEDI can peer between the leaves of tree canopies and offer insight into the structure of forested areas, such as canopy height, canopy cover, and vertical structure. This represents a huge advancement over exclusively top-down characterizations of biomass and may be combined with other products to produce a more comprehensive view of forest biomass than was previously possible. And now I will pass the mic back to Sativa for accessing and analyzing data. Thank you, Justin. In this section, I will briefly highlight NASA resources available for accessing and analyzing data. Earth Data Search is the gateway for search and discovery of NASA Earth Science Data. NASA Earth Data is a free open data center which you can sign up for to access a variety of data products. Some examples of available data that may be useful for the remote sensing of invasives include things like surface reflectance, leaf area index, the normalized difference vegetation index, above ground biomass, canopy height, precipitation, and temperature. Earth Data Search provides easy to use access to the Earth Observing System Data and Information System Services, or EODIS for short. Earth Science Data is here, and users are allowed to discover, filter, visualize, and access NASA data. An Earth Data login is required to download NASA Earth Science Data. Throughout the United States exist the Distributive Active Archive Centers, or the DACs, which work to effectively and efficiently serve the science user community. They are managed by the Earth Science Data and Information System Project, which is responsible 
for EOSDIS science systems. This design not only spreads the load across many systems, it also allows individual DACs to customize services to meet the needs of the specific science disciplines they serve, which include atmosphere, calibrated radiance and solar radiance, cryosphere, human dimensions, land, and ocean. In addition, by adopting a system using many DACs to archive and distribute data, NASA ensures that the system can easily scale to meet the growing production of science data and handle future missions that will generate greater quantities of data. I'd like to highlight one of the DACs called the Land Processes Distributed Active Archive Center, or the LP DAC. The LP DAC is a NASA USGS partnership that has been going on since 1990. The DAC is located in Sioux Falls, South Dakota at the USGS EROS Center, and it provides open, no-cost access to a large archive of land remote sensing data, specifically land remote sensing data acquired by satellites. Some JEDI data products are linked on the GitHub here for those of you who are interested in exploring further. One resource managed by the LP DAC is the application for extracting and exploring analysis ready samples, or APPEARS, which offers a simple and efficient way to access and transform geospatial data from a variety of federal data archives. APPEARS enables users to subset geospatial data sets using spatial, temporal, and band layer parameters. Two types of sample requests are available point samples for geographic coordinates and area samples for spatial areas via vector polygons. Sample requests submitted to APPEARS provide users not only with data values, but also associated quality data values. Interactive visualizations with summary statistics are provided for each sample within the application, which allows users to preview and interact before downloading their data. Another web tool to explore is NASA's Worldview. Worldview offers a cutting edge platform for Earth observation, providing users with real-time access to a wealth of satellite imagery and data. This powerful tool enables scientists, researchers, and the public to monitor and analyze dynamic Earth processes, including atmospheric conditions, land cover changes, and natural disasters. With a user-friendly interface, NASA Worldview allows for the exploration of global data sets, empowering users to create custom visualizations and gain valuable insights into Earth's intricate systems. The platform integrates data from an array of Earth-observing satellites, offering a comprehensive and up-to-date perspective on our planet's ever-changing environment. Google Earth Engine is a cloud-based platform that allows users to visualize and analyze satellite imagery of Earth. Google Earth Engine has a lot of potential for land monitoring applications. Applications like long-term monitoring of landscape change, computation of relevant indices, evaluating parameters like vegetation, soil, snow cover, and time series and change detection analysis of land surface features. Google Earth Engine also includes functionalities for calculating summary statistics, validation, and accuracy assessment, as well as the visualization and presentation of results. Google Earth Engine developers have really tried to make the platform as robust as other GIS platforms for processing, analyzing, and displaying satellite data. Climate Engine is another user-friendly tool which utilizes the Google Earth Engine platform to visualize and interact with Earth observation data sets for environmental monitoring. As noted on the Google Cloud website, it can assist in climate change risk planning in areas such as water use, agriculture, storm risk, and wildfire spread. Now time to summarize what we have covered in today's webinar. We covered an overview of a remote sensing of invasive species, and we learned that invasive species are non-native species with negative impacts to the environment, biodiversity, the economy, and human health worldwide. Invasives are predicted to increase with climate change. 
Remote sensing can be used for the detection and monitoring of invasive species. We can use remote sensing to identify invasives through phenological and spectral differences. NASA has a variety of available data and resources to aid in monitoring of invasive species, such as the satellites and sensors that were shared in detail in this presentation. There are also platforms that are available and listed here. Part two will focus on remote sensing of aquatic invasives and includes a guest lecture from Aaron Hester of UC Merced, and it will be hosted by Justin. In that training, we will cover the following objectives. As a reminder, to receive credit for participation, you must attend all three live sessions and complete the homework assignment by September 11th. The assignment will be posted to the training webpage as a Google form. You can expect to receive your certificate via email about two months after the course. Our contact information can be found here, along with links to our website, social media, and YouTube channel. Feel free to also explore our sister programs, NASA Develop and Servere. Here are some resources to reference related to today's training. Thank you for joining us today. We will move on to Q&A shortly. For now, we're going to answer the questions that um, we have received throughout the presentation. And a summary of those questions and responses will be available to you a little bit later, as we may take some time to um, you know, add more detail to the answers. But the first question that we had was, is there a geo database we can query for invasive, invasive lists globally? And our suggestion is to start off in that IPBES report. Um, it's a really thorough, long report, and the link will be shared with you all again in this document as a place to kind of understand which invasives um, have been noted and documented as well as their impacts. There are a variety of sources on invasive species, but one that we have listed here is the IUCN Global Invasive Species Database. Um, and you can find that at the IUCNGISD.org. Um, there are a variety of um, other resources that use uh, like citizen science approaches. So when people witness invasives, um, there can be collective data pools there as well. So we'll go ahead and um, add that as well um, to this document. So for question two, I want to monitor a lake which is covered with an invasive species, Ceratophyllum demersum. I have a lot of problems accessing the affected lake. Can you help me please? So if the issue is physical access, then remote sensing could be a good approach to help you. Using something like the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index can help differentiate the invasive species from the background water signature. So a lot of this is gonna depend on the size of the lake, um, which sensor may be available with the appropriate spatial resolution to, to help you. Um, and if you tune in to next week's session, there will be more information on some approaches to monitoring invasives, aquatic invasives particularly. So I um, encourage you to listen in and um, see how some of this work is being done. Okay, so we also had a question about smartphones with hyperspectral sensors, uh, particularly iPhone 14 Pro having a LiDAR scanner. Any hope of this in the future that we know of? So we'll get back to you on this question. This is a, a little bit out of um, what we covered in this webinar. And so we have to take some time to see if we can find any resources that um, mention any use of, of the phone iPhone particularly, or any phones with hyperspectral or LIDAR sensors. So this is a little bit, a little bit um, out, of our, out of our expertise. So thank you for the question. 
The fourth question we received is where can I find the values or spectral signatures of each of the species? Is there a library? I ask this because sometimes the plants are intermixed and it is difficult to differentiate which is which during classification. Yes, that's absolutely true. Um, we, we understand <laughs> that um, when there are groups of, of plants, sometimes it's hard to say with a lot of confidence um, using remote sensing, which is which, but um, spectral signatures of living organisms can change slightly based on their environmental conditions. The gold standard for determining those spectral signatures is to use an in situ signature collection approach with a handheld device. This is also important for classification as it helps tie remote sensing observations to their ground truth for those spectral signatures. So kind of using a, a double approach. So not relying solely on the remote sensing to do all the work, but having some ground based um, observations as well can help. And Sativa, this is Juan. Can I add a little bit? Uh... Absolutely, Juan. Love to hear yeah. from you. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to mention also that I'm, for plants in particular, you know, it's it's really important to consider the phenology uh, of the plants because, as we know, you know, they there might be changes through the year based on the on whether they are uh, during their flowering period or or uh, any other you know any any other time during the year. So that's uh, that's something uh, to consider as well. Um, and I would also kind of like similar to what you did in, in a previous question, I would also encourage uh, this participant to to join us uh, not only on next week, but also on the the last session of this uh, webinar series, which is especially on on grassland. Uh, species and uh, hyperspectral, so it might be might, might be uh, additional information there that might be useful. Thanks. So we have a question: Can you comment on examining relatively short-sized herb and shrub invasive species such as Artemisia, ones that could be sometimes covered by tree canopy? So one. Um, uh, Thing that we highlighted in this webinar was JEDI. Um, and JEDI uses LIDAR to record the vertical composition of, of space. And so this can allow um, kind of a understanding of the difference of height of species, which may you know, help in that process. Um, it does not enable classification based on spectral signatures, however. So um, again, this is giving us more an idea of, of height and, and depth of that, that space. So we could use something like mentioned by Juan, um, such as phenology. So the different times that, you know, the um, vegetation is going through its, its yearly cycle. So, so again, one of the limitations, you know, remote sensing can be helpful, but certain things like that, we can't, can't quite peek through um, with more of an optical approach. Next question, why is C WIFS no longer operational? So, uh, you know, this is uh, something that we experience with, with many missions. So they have a life cycle um, that they're funded for, and eventually they become no longer operational. Um, there could also be, you know, issues with, with certain uh, missions as well, which may cause them to be, um, you know, stopped earlier. So the Sea Whips mission itself lasted from 1997 to 2010. So we got a good amount of data from this uh, mission, and we're we're grateful for that. So another um, information, another place you can access information is via the NASA Ocean Color website, particularly NASA NASA Ocean Color. And again, these will be linked in this final document. We're going to get back to you on question seven. Um, with hyperspectral being such a newer approach, um, this could be, you know, take a little bit of more research to on our part to um, to respond with the the exact kind of spectral band combinations. Um, I think it would be dependent on the um, data set itself as well as what you are particularly looking for in terms of, of plant species. But I will say that session three 
we'll be um, covering grass uh, invasive, grassland invasives using hyperspectral. So tune in to session three. Question eight, how can I differentiate invasive species from other vegetation? Can you please explain the method and methodology required for spatial and temporal resolution? So it's, it's certain that there is no one size fits all approach our methodology for determining which plants are invasives versus the background vegetation. So as we've mentioned several times, things like the phenological differences, such as an early leaf out and the time data collection to maximize the differences of your target species and that of the background vegetation. Um, so we're gonna cover some examples of these approaches in part two and three. So thank you for the question. So I think that our team is gonna need some time to go through a majority of these additional questions that have been um, added more recently. Um, is that fair to say, team, that we can take some time with this document and come back to it? Yeah, um, the document keeps growing. I'm trying to keep up, but uh, I think we'll have to get back to most of these. Uh, there's a lot of really great questions on here. Thank you all so much. And thank you for moving them um, if they were in the chat previously to this Q&A document. But we are documenting those. We really do appreciate you all being here with us. Um, please download the PowerPoint. Um, there's some links to resources there as well as the names of the um, studies that were referenced. But again, this will be available to you uh, in, in a bit. Just give us some time to fill it out. And thank you again. Thanks. And, and also, Sadiba, I just, just remember to uh, briefly mention this is one that, uh, that uh, within our set, we did, uh, there was a, a training on phenology in particular that uh that we did a couple of years ago uh i believe and uh um and probably has a lot of uh, i see that a lot of questions that are related to phenology in particular so so we we can include the link to that training and maybe some of the answers are are already there excellent thank you juan yes that one is linked in um the powerpoint so we highly encourage you to check out that seminar as well. We will catch you back here next week. Thank you so much.